Okay. Um, I will say I haven't had time to grade your last homework assignment yet, so I'll probably get to that this afternoon. Um, if not this afternoon, then tomorrow morning. So you'll, you'll get that back soon. I'm trying to get stuff back quickly. Yeah, Brandon. If we did miss one assignment, do you want us to tell you when we turn that in, or just turn it in? And you um, to you will probably need to tell me okay. because I'll need to open the folder back up. Um, so yeah, if, if you have some. Um, if you have something you missed and you want to submit it late, um, that's fine. But yeah, tell me so I can open the poll. Any other questions? Okay, then um, let's go ahead and start jumping into this. Um, and those of you who are still taking down the questions, um, you can uh, catch up in a minute. Um, how did this go for y'all? What did you think of this? Honestly? Uh-huh. I don't <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, at least you were honest. Well, I got to check and see if I can go through my, I picked up my writing analytics on Tuesday. Uh-huh. And analytics was a so. Okay. Okay, so 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 the so, 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 so you you don't have this book yet. Oh yeah, it didn't say analytics. <laughs> oh, okay, no, it's yeah, that's just yeah, I have that one. Okay, yeah, yeah. So pr pretty much um, everything we're going to be reading the next couple weeks is going to be in this book. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what, what about what about the rest? Of you? Like, what, what what did you think of this? How'd this go? Okay. What do you mean by like, what do we think about? Like, you mean like what do you think about his ideology? Or? Yeah, just a any impressions that you had of it. Um, to me, a lot of it seemed like kind of common sense. Okay. How so? Can you give me like can you give an example? The way he described leadership was very basic. Like he was kind of just like if you're a good man, then good people will follow you. And it okay. Just like, And yeah, we're and you know we're only reading like the we're only reading a very small portion of it that's very focused on a particular issue. But yeah, um, so uh, the leadership issue. So yeah, so that a good leader is basically a virtuous person, right? Pardon? Most religions. Okay, how so? Just a lot of the, um, you know, tree of so you want to tree and stuff like that. Okay, yeah. I mean, those parties, like everything. Yeah, like, yeah, the, uh, the, the so called uh, golden rule there, right? Yeah, yeah that this is something that we find in just about every religious tradition, right? Although I think in Confucianism, um, it is actually particularly important um, and occupies a much more central place. Uh, than it does in uh, certain other traditions. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll talk we'll talk about that as well. Um, anything else that you guys pulled out of this? I had two things that I had. Okay. I I was looking at the, when he said that people should behave in ways that are appropriate to the social role that they occupy. Uh huh. I like that kind. Of or at least like okay. modernly, if someone said all the things that you were saying that would like contradict kind of like everything that you were saying about being a good person, then you yeah. like downplay people who are like or maybe like saying you should act for it. That's okay. how I think that is. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think, yeah, he's thinking about social hierarchies, right, in a way that we tend not to. And I think that some of the, like, some of this is, uh, an issue with um, American society and American ideology generally, right? Like, we may have discussed this before, but, you know, we tend to think of ourselves as a classless society, even though observation can tell us that that's not really true, right? Um, the word middle class in the United States is basically meaningless 
because virtually everyone describes themselves that way, right? It's very broad. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's basically we mean by middle class, like we're not homeless, basically. Yeah, it's you're not. yeah, you're not homeless and you're not a king or a lord, right? That's because <laughs> you know we we don't technically have kings or lords, right? Um, but. Confucius is writing in a society that has a much more clearly defined hierarchical class structure, right? So that's one thing we have to remember that we're uh, that we have to remember when we're reading this that he is assuming a hierarchical class structure. Where there are kings who kings and lords who must be obeyed, right? And different gradations down the up and down that social scale. So, <clears throat> how much do you guys know about the history of ancient China? I'm gonna um, pardon. <laughs> <ages>. <laughs> okay, that's Japan, um, but okay. <laughs> so no, no, no. Okay, because yeah, I'm just uh, the only the reason I ask is because some of you said. That, some of you said that you read so that you read some excerpts from this in high school, and I didn't know how much context uh, you were given. I like dynasties in China, all the dynasties, like the Q and the Shang. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 there was a lot of unification in the division. Yeah, yeah. So Confucius is writing at the end of one of the ancient dynasties that kind of precedes the, the formation of modern China, right, the Zhao dynasty. And by the time Confucius is born, uh, the Zhao dynasty um, is pretty much like a dynasty in name only, right? They only control a very small amount of land. Um, none of the nobles actually really listen to them. Um, they've lost any kind of real power or authority they have over the broader region. So the, this particular period in Chinese history is called the Spring and Autumn Period. And it runs from about 771 to 476 BCE. So are we looking here at a fast decline or a long, slow, gradual decline? Slow. Yeah, we're looking at social breakdown, right? Happening over a period of centuries here. It takes time for a dynasty to end. Yeah, absolutely. And when you've got like certain, well, certain set, well-established social structures, right? They will often remain in place even after whatever put them in place uh, kind of like dissolves and fades away, right? So Confucius is born near the end of this period. And so a lot of what his philosophy is concerned with is preserving st some level of stability in a period of decline, right? How do we restabilize a society that is falling apart. And so what he essentially does is what the historians Eric Hobsbawm, Eric Hobsbawm and um, Terence Ranger uh, call an inventive, an inventive tradition, right? You come up with a new system and you pretend it's something old that people have always been doing. And to be fair, most traditions more or less start out this way, right? Somebody has to be the first person to do something. And often when they do, they will cloak it in a kind of old fashioned symbolism, right? To suggest that this is really ancient wisdom that has been handed down from time immemorial, right? Whereas most traditions actually rarely, rarely last more than a you know more than a century or two. Um, so, um, is everybody done with this? By the way, can I turn this off and put it away? I'm almost there. I'm 
Okay. Okay. Um, so, <clears throat> one of the things that Confucius observed, this is one of the reasons why he's so concerned with how people in different classes should behave to each other, is that the lords of various territories were starting to usurp what had once been the prerogatives of the emperor, right? They were just kind of doing these things for them, like certain rituals, for example, that only the emperor was allowed to preside over were being run by the duke's households in these other territories, right? On top of that, the old aristocratic social structure was falling apart and becoming a lot more mobile. Confucius himself, or to give him his uh, proper name in Chinese, Kung Fu Tse, belonged to a class of people who were referred to as Xi, uh, which translates in English to something like men of skill. So these Xi were people who um, in previous eras would have had the kind of an equivalent social rank to a knight, right? Like kind of like lower nobility. And they were originally uh, providers of military support to their lords, you know, much like a knight would have been in feudal Europe, right? Um, but as their social position became less secure, most of them kind of went mercenary. And so they started hiring themselves out as kind of. Um, general purpose scholar, general ministers to different lords in various territories, right? So what Confucius is trying to do is reform this particular system into something more stable and into something that actually promotes virtue and not just per personal private interest in these different states, right? Okay, so any questions so far? Yeah, Haley. Is that the word, is it above, is it ranger above it? Hobsbawm. Okay. H-O-B-S-B-A-W. That's just the, the name of the historian that uses, uses this particular term. Okay, can I, uh, I can get rid of this now? Okay. Yes, so one of the big things Confucius does is come up with a metaphor to describe the entire human social world, right? To Confucius, life is essentially a ritual. What's a ritual? Something that's like culturally, um, it's like something that our culture always does. Okay, yeah. Yeah, it, it, right, it, it's, it's usually traditional, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was there for, like, um, like a tradition to a specific culture. Yeah, it's shared by members of a culture or a particular religious group, right? But what is a ritual? Like a practice? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a practice, right? Actually, usually more like a set of practices, right? Yeah. And is it something that you typically do on your own? There are some rituals one can yeah, perform on their own, right? Kind of depends. Yeah, but mo really, really. yeah, but usually they, usually they involve like, a group, yeah. usually involves a group of varying size, right? And more importantly, there's always a kind of prescribed set of steps, right? There's a prescribed pattern. A particular way that you're expected to do things, or it's not a ritual, right? 
so you know, take for example, um, I'm trying to think of like what a what a good example of uh, like a, like like a, a social ritual would be, right? Um, okay, so think of like something contemporary like a graduation ceremony, right? So this would be a good kind of like like contemporary kind of secular cultural ritual, right? Um, what happens? Um, if the uh, person running the graduation uh, forgets to tell you all to turn your caps around, or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or you know, or, or if you know that the, the person who was supposed to have your diplomas ready failed to get them printed, right? Yeah. Basically, it screws up the whole ritual, right? It screws up the whole thing. So if, if one person does something out of step, outside the prescribed pattern, then the whole thing falls to crap, right? The whole thing falls apart. Now, you know, graduation may seem like a comparatively trivial, like, you know, basically all they have to do now is, you know, a few keystrokes on a computer and the mistake is corrected, right? But for Confucius, the social stakes of ritual are a lot higher. And he's also really only thinking of this as a metaphor for human life more broadly, right? That we all have our particular roles in the ritual. We all have things that we're assigned to do. And we are expected to perform those roles to the utmost of our ability. Now, if someone has placed us in a role that we are not suited for, it's not our fault if the ritual fails. It's the fault of the person who put us there, right? This is one of the responsibilities of a leader, is to know how best to treat the people underneath him, right? Everything, does, does all this make sense so far? Everybody following me? Okay, good. Um, the other key element here, right, because a ritual involves everybody working together. Um, you know, somebody noted the whole golden rule thing earlier. The key in a lot of ways to Confucian philosophy is this idea of reciprocity. That you are expected to behave to, pe to people as you would want them to behave towards you. But this is also kind of conditioned by your social standing relative to the other person, right? So if you are dealing with someone who is your superior, you are supposed to show them respect, even if they haven't actually done anything to deserve it, right? If you are dealing with someone who is your social inferior, then you are expected to treat them with kindness and generosity. So while there is an idea of social hierarchy here, right, the idea isn't just that rich people get to push everybody else around. A rich person who pushes everybody else around and sets things up for his own gain um, is screwing up the ritual for everyone, right? Is stepping out of place and is behaving destructively. Okay, everybody's still with me. Any questions? Good. So, I want to try to give you all a little bit of Confucian vocabulary here so because I think that that will help us to understand some of the key concepts that we're talking about. So the word for ritual in Chinese is li. And li also means propriety, that is kind of proper social behavior, which is the way it's translated here, right? So when the text here uses the word propriety, the Chinese word they're translating is li, which means both of these things, right? 
It means ritual, it also means proper social behavior. The word for reciprocity, treating others how you expect to be treated, is shu. And what you get by following this practice of Shu and Li, right? The goal is to develop Ren. Which can be translated as benevolence, as humanity, or as it's translated here, virtue. Personally, I think the most accurate translation in Confucian terms is humanity, because it, the goal seems to be to kind of build yourself up as a kind of full human participant in life, the universe, and everything, right? Now, <clears throat> the person who has developed Ren. And this is a big deal when it comes to explaining Confucius' concept of leadership, right? So we've already noted that his idea of a good leader, right, seems to be a virtuous person whom people will want to imitate, right? So that virtue expresses itself as a kind of spiritual magnetism called day. Right, and that's described in um, this first selection here from the Analytics. If we look on page 437, um, can I get somebody to read uh, that first little bit for us? Right? The master said, he who exercises government. You said it was 437? 437, yep. Which one is it you said? Uh, the master said, he who exercises government. Do you want to read it? Yep, go for it. The master said, He who exercises government by means of his virtue may be compared to the north polar star which keeps its place and all the stars turning towards it. Okay, so how do we interpret this metaphor then in light of everything we've just drawn out here? What's special about the north polar star? How is it different from other stars? Yes, that's the important thing here. Yeah, the North, the North Polar Star is the only fixed point in a moving sky, right? So how does this metaphor and vision the ruler in comparison to the ruled. Yeah, go ahead, Brandon. They revolve around him or they're attracted to him. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're talking again about, like, you know, the ma magnetic pole here, right? You know, the, the ancient Chinese understood how these things worked. Um, they certainly you know, they understood magnetism. And, yeah, they're just, they're, the people are drawn to the virtue of the leader, right? and will simply fall into place around him so long as he acts virtuously, right? So that's exercising this kind of spiritual magnetism, right? That a leader who follows the way but doesn't have to do anything to organize the people, right? They'll simply follow. I think we see this developed a little bit in the next one. Can I get somebody to read us? Uh, the master said that the people be led by laws. The master said, Thank you, James. If the people be led by laws and uniformity sought to be given them by punishments, they will try to avoid the punishment but have no sense of shame. If they be led by virtue and uniformity sought to be given them by the rules of propriety, they will have the sense of shame and moreover will become good. Okay, so what two things are being weighed against each other? What what's what are being what, what are the things being contrasted? Laws and virtue. Okay, yeah, laws and virtue. And how 
how is Confucius envis envisioning these things uh, differently? If the people be led by laws and uniformity sought to be given them by punishments, they will try to avoid the punishment but have no sense of shame. What does that mean? They will try to hide their wrongdoing. Okay. Avoid punishment. Well, and is it that? Them. Well, they necessarily try to hide their wrongdoing. What will be the re? If, if you rule the people simply by uniform a uniform set of laws, right? What is he suggesting will happen if you're trying to enforce those laws through punishment? Well, they're going to try to avoid the punishment, right? What are they not going to try to do? So if they're following the law, right, why are they following it? Yeah, solely because they're afraid of punishment, right? So, does Confucius seem to think that laws actually help anyone to become a better person? Yeah, they can create order, right, or at least the illusion of it, but only by making people afraid of being punished, right? They're afraid, but that's not going to be, being afraid isn't going to make them good, right? So how does one make the people good, right? If they led by virtue and uniformity sought to be given them by the rules of propriety, they will have the sense of shame and moreover will become good. What does it mean to be ashamed? How do we feel when we feel ashamed? You feel guilty. Yeah, you feel guilty. Yeah, embarrassed, disappointed in yourself, right? So, how is this then different from making, like, why is making people feel ashamed better, according to Confucius, than making them afraid of punishment? Shame will make them want to be a better person. Yeah. The, Yeah, and shame he's regarding as more of an impetus to improve your behavior, right? Like, and not just to improve your behavior, but to improve yourself, right? So, <clears throat> you remember uh, last time we were um, looking at uh, the purpose of education, right? We talked about the difference between you know, like internal and external motivators, right? We actually have something like that happening here, right? Confucius is arguing that the external motivator doesn't really work. And what you have to do is make people want to change their inside circumstances rather than their outside circumstances. I know that it's probably sounded a little bit more hippy dippy than I meant it to, right? But we all um, we all get the point, right? Okay. Good. Um, so, can I get somebody to read the next one for us? So, with the Duke, I asked. Do you want to read that one? Anybody can, whoever. The Duke, I asked, saying, "What should be done in order to secure the submission of the people?" Confucius replied, "Advance the upright and set aside the crook." then the people will submit. Advance the crooked and set aside the upright, then the people will not submit. Okay, so first off, when we have the Duke I asking his question here, what is he asking Confucius about? What does he ask, what does he want? Submission. He wants submission, yeah. So what does that suggest about the kind of, the kind of solution he's looking for? If he wants the submission of the people, what does it sound like he wants the people to do? What do you want? 
Yeah. Roll over and do what I want, you bunch of ungrateful little fuckers, right? And does Confucius seem to give him the kind of advice he sounds like he wants? What is Confucius telling me he needs to do? Yeah, advance the upright and set aside the crooked, right? So what does that mean? Think about this in terms of uh, the sorts of things we said a good leader does in Confucius's vision, right? When assigning people to roles in the ritual. Uh, virtuous and uh, corrupt. Yeah, yeah, the, the, yeah, the up, upright crooked here, right? This is essentially Right? Virtuous or honest versus corrupt. And if your leader is promoting corrupt people to positions of authority, right? Now what does that suggest about his own character? That is lacking. Yeah, that he's either a bad judge of character, right? or that he himself is corrupt and is choosing people like himself. And then what message does that send to the people about the way to get ahead? Be corrupt. Yeah, be crooked, right? Be corrupt and that's the way you advance. Whereas if you are setting honest people in positions of authority, you are demonstrating that you are a good judge of character, and you are demonstrating to the people that you will get further by being virtuous and by being honest than you will by behaving selfishly and dishonestly, right? All pretty simple so far, yeah? Everything makes sense? Was there anything in this that you all found a little bit um, confusing or difficult. I think that the idea of the, that every leader has to be virtuous uh -huh. is impossible. I just don't think it's, it could happen. Okay, why not? Because, I mean, well, this is a cliche, but everybody is different. <laughs> And also, uh -huh. I don't think leadership depends solely on virtue. Okay. So do you think there are situations when a corrupt leader is more effective well, I think than an upright or virtuous leader? Not necessarily more effective, but I think there are different factors okay. that besides virtue that make a good leader. Okay, the different situ and the different situations might call for different styles of leadership. Yeah. Okay. And maybe a corrupt leader could be better at certain points. Okay. But I think um, I'm asking less about problems people are having with the philosophy generally and more about anything you found in the text that <laughs> was difficult. <laughs> yeah, I want to let you have your say, right? <laughs> Was there anything in the text itself you all found difficult or confusing? You mean in general? Yeah. Both yeah. Or, you know, in general, or if there are specific parts you want to try to talk through. Okay. When he says the, the music master, I wasn't okay. sure about it. And I think that one thing that we have to keep in mind here is that um, a lot of the characters that he mentions in this would have been familiar to a 5th century BCE Chinese audience, right? So my guess is that this music master Mien is probably a known character of some kind 
and that the original audiences for this would have known uh, what he was supposed to have been like, right? Um, and what this would have represented. But I think, we, I think we can still kind of make a guess at what's going on here. If we, uh, <clears throat> would you mind reading that out for us, James? Just starting with the music master in the end. The music master men having called upon him when they came to the steps, the master said, here are the steps. When they came to the mat for the guests to sit upon, he said, here's the mat. When all were seated, the master informed him, saying, so and so is here, so and so is here. The music master men having gone out, say, Chang asked, saying, is it the rule to tell those things to the music master? The master said, yes. This is certainly the rule for those who lead the blind. Okay. And so are we given any indication that the music master is physically blind? No, right? So what is Confucius trying to suggest about this person? He's like oblivious. Yeah. That this is someone who doesn't get it on some level, right? So yeah, he's metaphorically blind. Because if he was physically blind, it would seem unlikely that the other character in Sei Chen would have thought anything odd about pointing all these things out to him, right? Um, but yeah, Confucius treats him like he's completely ignorant, right? So the blind here, I think, refers to the spiritually ignorant. And when someone is spiritually ignorant, or in this case, like if they seem to be ignorant of propriety or ignorant of the proper way to behave, right? then the only way to deal with them is almost as you would a child. Where you have, you know, you point out, here are the steps, here's the mat, these are all the people, right? So, <clears throat> because they don't know the way, they need to be shown. by the way, that is kind of shared amongst all Chinese philosophical religious traditions uh, for their particular way of life and way of belief um, is Tao. Right, which simply means the way. There is another philosophical system um, called Taoism. Um, and Taoism is it's completely distinct from Confucianism. Um, for one thing, it seems it's based originally in Chinese folk religion. And the other thing that makes it different um, is that if you are actually actively trying to follow it, if you are actively trying to be a Taoist, you have already failed. It's a kind of like philosophy of passivity and non-being in a lot of ways. But yeah, so the word Tao or the way can simply refer to any of these kinds of systems. Okay, so does that make a little more sense to you now? All right. Um, what else do you guys have questions about? Is there any, are there any parts, like I have plenty of parts I can try to talk through with you here, but I want to know like if there are particular parts that confused or interested you. Okay. Can you, um, can you read that out for us? Page 438, right? Yeah. So you come asked about government. The master said, the requisites of government are that there be sufficiency of food, sufficiency of military equipment, and the confidence of the people in their ruler. 
Say Kung said, if it cannot be helped and one of these must be dispensed with, which of the three should be foregone first? The military equipment, said the master. Say Kung asked again, again asked, if it cannot be helped and one of the remaining two must be dispensed with, which of them should be foregone? The master answered, part with food. From of old, death has been the lot of all men, but if the people have no faith in their rulers, there is no standing for the state. Okay. So what's the hierarchy of value here that Confucius creates? What's the least important thing? The military. Yeah, the military equipment he regards as the least important thing, right? The defense of the state, like, so the military equipment, like, probably representing here, like, the idea of defense of the state, right? And then what's the second least important thing? Food. Okay. The food is number two on the list. And the one indispensable thing, right, the thing you can't do without, is the confidence of the people. So what strikes us as odd about this list of, of values, or the way he's ranking these values? That it says they're the least. Well, these are the things that he, the three things he thinks are essential to a state, right? But um, <clears throat> confidence is the most important, the confidence of the people and their leaders. Food, right, the means of actual physical sustenance is of secondary importance. And then the least important of these three essential things is the military equipment used for defense, right? What do you think is the value system that's informing this ranking? How is he coming up with this ranking of priorities? Okay. Uh-huh. And I guess you can't have confidence from the people if they don't have food. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, well, how, 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 does, how, does, how does he solve that little problem? He says, you know, from old, death has been the lot of all men. Right? Everybody dies. But if the people have no faith in their rulers, there is no standing for the state. Yeah, that the only thing that props up a state, right, the only thing that supports it is the confidence of the people in their leadership. And when the people have no confidence in the leadership, it doesn't matter whether the people can be fed or not or whether the state can be defended. There is no state anymore. Right? Confucius's whole idea of the state is bound up in these kind of networks of mutual respect and trust. And if those networks of respect and trust break down, then there's nothing left to defend. Or at the very least, nothing worth defending. What about this? What about the one that follows this here? Se Chang asked how virtue was to be exalted and delusions to be discovered. The master said, hold faithfulness and sincerity as first principles and be moving continually to what is right. This is the way to exalt one's virtue. You love a man and wish him to live. You hate him and wish him to die. Having wished him to live, you also wish him to die. This is a case of delusion. It may not be an account of her being rich, yet you come to make a difference. So... I bring this one up because I struggled to interpret what this means. Like, really, until this morning, right? <laughs> I have read this several times before, and I had no frigging clue for a long time how to deal with this. What do you think he's talking about here? You love a man and you wish him to live. You hate him and you wish him to die. Having wished him to live, you also wish him to die. This is a case of delusion. Because all living things end. So I was about to say, yeah. 
It is true that all living things end, right? And they end up dying anyways. Yeah. Either one is both dying, one is just faster than the other. Uh huh. Can anybody determine what kind of relationship he's talking about here, though? Who you both love and want to live and hate and wish to die at the same time? I mean, other than like a love hate relationship? The ruler? Um, similar to the ruler, at least in the, uh, the kind of patriarchal system we're talking about. I was, yeah. I was thinking, I was thinking. Oh, you're a um, you're thinking along the right lines there. Would it be kind of like not necessarily like... So it is family related? It is, yeah. Yeah, that's it's fa I'm Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a family relationship we're talking about here. Yeah. And that was actually like, that was my epiphany this morning, right? Is that, that was what this was about. It's a family relationship, but it's a specific family relationship. Is it like... Dad, yes, it's talking about a father-son relationship, right? So why, even if a son loves his father and wishes him to live, might he also hate his father and wish him to die? Because he wants to be king, wants to be ruler. Yeah, he wants to inherit, right? Mm -hmm. So what, what here is being condemned is a delusion. wants him to live, but also wants that um, everything passed down to him at the same time. Uh huh. Because like he cares about his dad, loves his dad, but also wants to hurry up and be the ruler. Right. And in doing so, the only way for you to do that, right? The only way for, for that to happen is, yeah, exactly. It's for you to inherit, right? And I mean, even in just like like a regular family relationship, even if we're not talking about a ruler, right? Um, typically, you don't get your inheritance until the person who has the stuff now passes away, right? Yeah, like stuff in their will. Yeah. So he's talking here about a kind of desire for riches and a desire to inherit. That's the, that's the delusion, right? That's the problem, is that selfishness, right? That desire to move the self into the place of the parent, right? So this is an illustration of a concept. I forget what the Chinese word for this is, but um, it's usually translated into English as filial piety. And it's, a, it's another central Confucian concept. So does anybody know what filial means? OK, so filial. Uh, refers to uh, a child's relationship to his or her parents, right? And piety is this kind of relationship of reverence and respect, right? So a central tenet of Confucian philosophy, which is very much connected to this whole idea of ritual and propriety, right? One of the key elements of ritual and propriety is respect and love for one's parents. And this is input. So being a child and respecting and loving your parents ultimately teaches you to respect and love your social superiors. And being a parent and showing love and generosity for your children teaches you how to deal with your social inferiors, right? The basic idea here then being that the family is a kind of model for larger relationships between the individual and the state, right? And this is not something that's necessarily specific uh, to Chinese culture, right? There are lots of other cultures in which like the, the family is kind of used as the model um, for, for government. For example, the ancient Greeks, for example, modeled uh, or always used a, the, you know, like the single family household as a kind of um, microcosm of the government or the state, right? You know, it's, you can't have um, a secure state unless you have secure families, right? If there's order in the family, there's order in the state. 
All right. Anything else that you guys want to talk about here? Are there any patterns you guys are notice emerging here, by the way, as we are looking at these different pieces of this? Any particular patterns or key language that you're picking up on? I was going to say shame doesn't work unless society is there. Okay, yeah. Explain. If no one is, no, if no one knows what you did, yeah, and knows it is wrong, uh huh, then will you feel shame? Mm -hmm. And if there's no one to teach you, if there's no one to teach you what you did was wrong, right? How do you know? So we are kind of, yeah, we are dealing with the world here in which morality is basically social, right? You learn morality from those around you, from your environment, not so much um, from kind of like individual stirrings of conscience, right? Your conscience develops, or your, your idea of a conscience develops through your social interactions. Um, this is actually kind of not too far off um, from Freudian psychology, actually, in a lot of ways. Right? Does anybody understand uh, Freud's theory of the personality, like it's the, the theory of the unconscious? You know what the three parts are? Um, thinking. It's been two years, or it's been almost two years. Uh-huh. Okay. It's there. I promise you. It's there. Okay. I'm gonna put a couple. I'm gonna put some words up on the board and see if they ring a bell. Okay. Yes. Because it's like the iceberg. Yeah. Yeah. The ego, the self, right? The I that you're aware of is just the tip of the iceberg. That's you know the part you're conscious of at least partly, and that is formed by the push and pull between these other forces, id and superego, right? So the id is the animal part of your brain that wants things, right? It wants food, it wants sex, it wants stuff, and it doesn't care what it has to do to get them, right? The superego is often compared to a conscience but it's actually, I think, something closer to what we're talking about here, where it's really more the weight of social disapproval, right? Right? Why do we not, you know, simply, like, run around outside with our pants off screaming, right? Because people wouldn't like us if we did that, right? Because people would disapprove of that. In fact, you know, police, or probably more appropriately doctors, would show up and haul us away. So in Freudian psychology, right, in this kind of Western model, you need both of these things to be a functional person, right? If they control each other. Yeah, they keep each other in check, right? If your id is too strong, then you become a narcissist, right? And you just pursue your own pleasure without regard for what you're doing to other people. If your superego is too strong, then you lack any real independent will and you know you become a neurotic who can't really do anything for yourself, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> we are dealing here also with a model where morality is kind of formed socially. Um, but I think the Confucian vision of it is a little more positive, right? In fact, let's look uh, at this other passage on page 438 about um, perfect virtue. Right, can I get somebody to read this for us? Sorry, with Yen Yuan asked about perfect virtue. Where is this? Uh, page 438, the first one. The master said, to subdue oneself and return to how do you say that? propriety is perfect virtue. If a man can for one day subdue himself and turn to propriety, and mm -hmm. under heaven will ascribe perfect virtue to him. In, this, in the practice of perfect virtue from a man himself, or is it from others? Okay, so <clears throat> propriety, you can remember, right, is about proper social behavior. 
So Confucius asks this question already expecting the answer. He says, is the practice of perfect virtue from a man himself or is it from others? What do you, how do you think he's answering this? What do you think his answer to this is? From others. Yeah. It's not something that comes, like, it's the shaping force that proper social behavior has on you, right? That forms your perfect virtue. Because perfect virtue can't exist outside of human relationships. If we look at the last paragraph, it says, Chung Kung asked about perfect virtue. The master said, it is when you go abroad to behave to everyone as if you were receiving a great guest, to employ the people as if you were assisting at a great sacrifice, not to do to others as you would not wish done to you, to have no murmuring against you in the country and none in the family. So the values we have represented here, right? Right, or hospitality and generosity. Seriousness. Kindness. And honor. Right, which is focused primarily on one's reputation. Are any of these private virtues? Maybe seriousness a little bit, right? But it's your seriousness in dealing with other people, right? And assigning them roles in the ritual. So the virtues that contribute to perfect virtue, right, for Confucius are all social virtues. So there is no being good, there is no being virtuous for him, right? Outside of a social context. Because it's entirely based on how you treat other people and how you expect other people to treat you. Okay, anything else that you guys want to discuss? By the way, did everybody understand here what, what he means when he is comparing the superior man to what he calls the mean man. Does everybody understand what he meant by mean here? Uh, no, um, it's, it's not like a mathematical mean. Less virtuous? Yeah, he's talking, he means less virtuous, and in particular he means like, mean here is used to mean kind of small or petty, right? So the Chinese word that is translated here as mean, the mean man is chow ren, where the word for the superior man is junsi. And the goal of Confucian practice is to transform yourself from a Chao Ren, which is what everybody starts out as, into a Junsi, right? Into, the, into a kind of superior person. By knowing your place in social relationships and behaving appropriately. Okay, um, so, I think that is pretty much all I have for you uh, today. So nobody has any questions about anything. For how many of you is this your last class today? Okay, so some of you are just itching to get out. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so yeah. So just remember for next time, right? We're going to be looking at the speech of Colgacus. And if you haven't yet done so, right, make sure you submit your three vocab words for this reading and do so by Tuesday for the 
for the Tacitus as well. Now those questions we've been writing now, what are those for? Uh, those are 